If you are doing Shakespeare in class and need some help, this might be the right video for you. When dealing with Shakespeare, you will probably have to analyze. And if you really don't know where to start, I will try to help you. Your teacher may have talked about rhythm and meter in the different verses. And if you really don't know what all that is supposed to be, then I'll try to help you in this video. When dealing with the meter, the first thing you have to figure out is the metric foot in your poem or your play, in this case in Shakespeare. There are four, well there are more, but there are four metric feet that you learn about at school, which is the iron, the trochee, the dactyl and the anapest. To figure out what metric foot you're dealing with, you have to find out how many syllables there are in the words first. So let's look at metric that has two syllables and in this case the me is stressed, trick is unstressed, metric. If you're trying to detect the metric foot it's always easiest to use words that you are familiar with. So, for example, names. It shows Sophie and Carla for our I am and Troki. Sophie has got two syllables and so does Carla. And I am and Troki deal with two syllables. Um, you have to consider which of these syllables is stressed. So, Sophie has an unstressed syllable and then a stressed one. And Carla, that's the, diff the other way around, has got a stressed syllable and an unstressed. Right? It's Sophie and Carla. Now if we're looking at dactyl and anapest, they deal with three syllables. The dactyl now let's get let's let's find some names first. So we've got Julia, three syllables, and Valerie, French. I couldn't find an English or a German name. Um, Julia has got a stressed, and then two unstressed syllables, and Valerie has got two unstressed and a stressed syllable. And these are your metric feet. In Shakespeare, you will basically be dealing with the iamb. Let's try this with Shakespeare. But soft what light through yonder window breaks, it is the east and Juliet is the sun. How do you figure out the meter in these lines. Well, as we said before, take those words that you are sure about where they are stressed and how many syllables they have. And for that, of course, you have to find words with more than one syllable. So for example, window. That's stressed and unstressed. Yonder. You can hear that too. Yonder. And we already said Juliet. And then if you hear the line again, but soft what light through yonder window breaks. So we've got but. And here we've got Juliet. It is the East and Juliet is the sun. Now we've got, we said, unstressed. Stressed, that's an I am. And we've got one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. 
we've got five items in each verse. One line here is a verse. So five, that's penta. And the meter in Shakespeare, therefore, is called the iambic pentameter because there are five iams in each verse. And if you look here, it's not rhymed, and therefore this thing is called blank verse. So in Shakespeare, you usually deal with blank verse iambic pentameter. Okay, I'm sure you're wondering now why this entire blank verse thing is important and what to do with it. So here's the first passage of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. It starts with the prologue, which is not very typical for Shakespeare's plays, but that's how it is. It's like a little trailer in the cinema, a stupid trailer a little bit because it gives away the whole story and especially the end, but never mind. What you can see in this trailer <laughs> is that it rhymes. So we've got dignity and mutiny, seen, unclean, foes, overthrows, life, strife, and so on. So for one thing, this is not blank verse, but it is, and I've already included that, iambic pentameter. You've got five stresses or five iams, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, stressed in each verse. So um, let's look at the meter here and especially find passages, if there are any, that don't work according to the meter, but that break the meter. I guess you can be pretty sure that Shakespeare was clever enough to stick to the meter. So if we actually find lines that break with the meter, this is not by accident or because Shakespeare couldn't do any better. But usually if you then use this as a starting point for your analysis, uh, you are on a pretty good track. The first thing you do is to check whether your regular iambic pentameter that you could always just mark above the lines fits. How do you do that again? You look at the poly, polysyllabic words, so more than one syllable. For example, households. Households. Stressed, unstressed. That fits. Alike. Fits. Dignity. Fits. Verona. Fits. Ancient. Mutiny. So that looks pretty good. Now the next step to find the breaks, you could read the thing like a robot, really overdoing the stresses and the, the unstressed syllables, and by doing so detecting passages that you might read differently. Two households, both alike in dignity. That's the first thing I would probably already mark differently. I think if I read it not like a robot, I would say two households, both alike in dignity. So I would actually stress the first syllable there, which makes per perfect sense because you are breaking the meter in order to start the whole thing. Remember, there was no curtain or light or anything in the Globe Theatre. In fair Verona, where we lay our scene. Works. From ancient grudge brick to new mutiny. I wouldn't agree with this line. I think if you read it not like a robot, you would say from ancient grudge break to new mutiny. And therefore you would stress the break and then take a little bit of the stress away from this. 
from ancient grudge break to new mutiny. Where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows with their death bury their parents' strife. Ah, you could already hear that. The word is pronounced bury their parents' strife. So this is a line that breaks the meter. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end not could remove, could argue that maybe not could remove. This could also be stressed, not necessarily, but possibly. Is now the two hours traffic of our stage. The which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. Okay, I zoomed out now so you can see the entire 14 lines. By the way, this thing, 14 lines, it's a sonnet if you look at the rhyme scheme, but that's not our topic at the moment. Um, you can see that there are two lines that now stick out because they've got the break that we found. Possibly a third line, but this, well, this could be discussed. But certainly you would stress break and you know bury must be pronounced in a different way. So stressed on the first syllable. Now, if we look at these two lines, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, and doth with their death bury their parents strive, what are these lines about? What does this mean anyway, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny? There's an old feud, an old argument. These two families don't like each other, haven't done so for a long time. And now, from this ancient grudge, we've got another new argument, mutiny, another new feud. So in within this already grudging pair, two families, there's a new feud. That's how the entire plot starts in the first scene. And does with their death bury their parents' strife? So it this these lines are about the two lovers, Romeo and Juliet. And nothing could end this feud, but the death of the children. So that's basically the most important lines of this entire prologue, of the entire plot. There's an old feud and nothing could end it but the death of the two children, which you, we already found here in this line that nothing could end the strife between the families, but the death of the two children. So by finding the break in the meter, you already found the most important lines where you could start the analysis from, content-wise. And then if you look at this first break in meter, the funny thing is that the word that breaks the meter is even break, so there's a little hidden joke by Mr. Shakespeare here. We've also got the two at the beginning. So if you looked at this poem again, at the sonnet, you could find all kinds of twos, twosomes in this. So things that are there twice, civil, civil, or the sound here from fourth, the fatal, or even opposites, like lovers and foes, or life and death, or parents and children, or parents is there twice, um, love and rage. Um, there are all kinds of pairs in here that I don't want to go into right now, but the two here is also stressed for a reason. 
So we must remember that in Shakespeare's time, you went to hear a play, not to watch a play. Everything is done by language. The entire play would have been in blank verse, da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum. And if you heard um, the actor or actress, no actor at that time, no actresses, um, pronounce something differently, so break the meter, you would listen up because those were the lines to pay attention to. And this is where you start your analysis. Look for the lines that break the meter and take it from there. Have fun. <laughs>